Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about the nature of intelligence and how artificial intelligence compares to the humankind. My guest is Gary Bradsky, a leading researcher in computer vision. That's how robots are able to see where they're going and machine learning. A successful entrepreneur and angel investor, Gary is founder and CEO of OpenCV, the world's most popular library of computer vision software. He was head of the computer vision team for Stanley, the early prototype driverless car that won the 2005 DARPA Grand Challenge and which now resides in the Smithsonian Institution. He helped <coughs> develop one of the first video search startups, VideoSurf, which was sold to Microsoft and later founded Industrial Perception Incorporated, which was sold to Google. He is currently co-founder and chief technology officer of Array.com, which makes a computer vision and deep learning production platform for the television and movie industries. Gary, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marty. Gary, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence these days, AI, but is it really intelligent or is it just mimicking human intelligence? So, so what people are talking about today is um, usually the, the big advances in, in AI today uh, is what's called deep learning. And it's really just a component of intelligence. It's the association turning a perception into association. Uh, so it's recognizing a pattern, segmenting something in, in the scene. Um, turning a voice waveform into recognized speech. That, that it's just one component of intelligence. I hope to talk later about how that component can work in a full mind, such as uh, instantiated in a robot. Well, does artificial intelligence mean that it can actually learn from experience? It can try several different methods of solving a problem, pick one that works best, then use that as a base for learning the next thing. So, I mean, the main, uh, uh, of course, you know, we, our, our intelligence rides on top of many processes, your breathing and, and other cues and attention, but, but the main thing people think of in, as intelligence is really a causal reasoning, that reasoning from cause and effect. And, and this does what's called, uh, you're able to play with what they call counterfactuals which are, what if I did this? Uh, so, you know, what if I didn't come to the studio today? What if I stood up? You know, what would happen? And, and that's how uh, a, a large component of what we consider this kind of procedural intelligence is made up of, and that's uh, a largely what a robot brain is made up of. Now we have an example <coughs> of uh, AI that you worked on, the Stanley Carr which was a driverless car, an early prototype. This was 2005, so this is right. a while ago. And a lot of driverless cars since then have used the knowledge gained in that. In fact, we have some slides uh, showing Stanley. Can we see the first slide, please? All right, okay, so this looks like it's crossing the finish line. Uh, right, so this is when Stanley won. They were turning the car off. Uh, you'll see a bank of LiDAR. Sick lasers that were on top, each angle that difference, and hard to see in the middle is the camera. It has GPS. It has uh, inertial. Uh, they call it IMU um, uh, that that uh, me measures movement, and it has motion recorders on the wheels and a, and a bunch of other sensors. Now this was for the DARPA Grand Challenge. For the benefit of viewers who might not be familiar with DARPA, what exactly is DARPA? DARPA is the Defense Research Agency. They're, they're more or less what passes for our industrial policy. But, so they're chartered with advancing research uh, uh, you know, for defense purposes. But really, it's the thing that launched the internet. Is they needed secure forms of communication that are, and, and so you know, they invented this packet switching that formed the basis of the internet. And, and many other advances have been done through DARPA where the government sets forth, the uh, defense agency sets forth an initiative, and then people come in to, to answer that initiative and, and advance the technology. Now we have a couple more images of Stanley. Can we see the next one, please? OK, so this is basically a diagram of the car that came from uh, Popular Mechanics, but it, it shows all the sensors. So you can see the lasers. Those are now what you would call LIDAR. Um, uh, camera, radar, um, 
uh, many other sensors, and of course it, the brain in the back <laughs> instead of ours in the front. Uh, now, what is LIDAR? Is that like radar? So, like the camera can see things, but it can't <coughs> tell how far away they are. Uh, yeah. So it sends a, a, a LIDAR is basically a range sensing. So it sends out a laser pulse and measures the time for it to come back. And as this thing scans across the scene, you, you build up an image of accurate, in, fairly accurate in depth. Now we have one more image about Stanley. Can we see that last Stanley picture, please? And I think this shows basically the algorithm of how it knows where it's going. Yeah, I mean, well, this is more on the perception. So you see Stanley, the view from the windshield. Uh, that that blue triangle, uh, that bl blue polygon in the leftmost, in in the leftmost, it is taken from the laser rangefinders. That's where they say for sure that's a drivable place. We found flat ground. The the camera then is what takes that signal and says find more ground that looks like that, and ex so that's the red coloring in the middle. So it's extended out this drivable area. Now all these sensors, including where it's traveling in the GPS, were on the right, fused in its brain in a bird's eye view. So we're looking down at the car as it's traveling here up screen. And you see it's a kind of three color world. White is saying that's drivable. Uh, red says you're gonna crash, don't go there. And gray is I don't know. So Stanley's brain had these three states. That whole plane, took the tilt uh, uh, that Stanley was actually uh, uh, experienced. So if it was on a hill, it would have the tilt of that hill. And, and then it would run physics simulations. It, its goal was to follow GPS waypoints. So you can think of that as our emotional system. Its emotional system was, I want to go to those goal points. And it, it ran simulations out to a couple of seconds. How can I hit them as fast as I can without tipping over? And then it would run for a tenth of a second and repeat the process. And that's how, it, that's how its brain got it to go across uh, the surface. It did all this planning, implemented it in the real world, and then, and, and then uh, kept moving. And that's real-time processing because the car is moving along. How fast does it go? Or did it go in this race? Well, I mean, I mean, the processing takes about a tenth of a second, which is kind of interesting because that's about our perception speed. But the, the car in the race, I believe they held it to below 30 miles an hour, but it, when we practiced, we'd go as fast as 50. Was there anybody in the car? When, when we were developing, we were sitting in the car, but when it was driving, there was no one in the car. Now, people say that AI is getting so smart that it's smarter than humans in many respects. So what can artificial intelligence do that maybe human intelligence cannot do? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I can get to this in terms of the robot brain, but, but obviously um, uh, you can design a brain that's focused on a task. Uh, say, <clears throat> you know, your, your uh, cat's brain is better at catching birds than you because it's designed for that. Stan uh, artificial, like Stanley, well, n now the Waymo or, or you know, Google cars that came out of that, they'll, they, they'll eventually become better drivers because their brain is devoted to that. Um, and, and so artificial intelligence right now can do things better, such as finding cancer cells in millions of cellular images. Humans would lose attention. The AI wouldn't, so you could say it's as exceeded AI in, in Google Deep Brain. Uh, we have a, a game playing interface and that's designed for that for basically game playing. Uh, it's got a lot of power, and so in in a lot of games it can now exceed uh, human performance. Chess was earlier on, but now uh, Go, which is really a harder game to play. Uh, the champion is now, you know, uh, Deep Mind at Google. Uh, so, so artificial intelligence—you can construct the brain to do better in any area. Our brain was constructed to help us survive and and find food and made and do many other things. So, it's not surprising that you can beat it in some specific areas or, or, or uh, you know, and things that really weren't part of our nature, like doing math and calculations. So computers are very good at mathematical computations and dealing with complicated formulas, but in what way are humans better? Like, for example, there are a lot of things that require judgment. 
Can computers make judgments other than what they're specifically programmed to do? Uh, I mean, sure, like humans, well, you're synthesizing information that's coming from your subconscious, but, but uh, you, you can make gut judgments. <clears throat> um, you know, humans are better at AI and probably always will be at being human. <laughs> And, and that is telling stories, relating socially. Um, it, 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 I suppose you know, we'll be able at one point to duplicate a human mind and run it somewhat faster and you could have a superhuman if you could put it in a body and, and keep it healthy. There's really no reason to do that, but you, know, you might want a robot that's really good at navigating on Mars and, and that uh, you know, may do that better than a human eventually. If robots do some things better than humans, it raises the question of why are humans better? I mean, some people might say, well, humans are more expendable than robots in some areas. Do, does this blur the distinction between man and machine, maybe to the disadvantage of man in some cases? Well, uh, maybe. I, I mean, people are afraid of, like, there'll be no work anymore. Robots will do it all. I, I think. Um, uh, they misunderstand the nature of work. Like, uh, if you have a room of people and everybody takes out what's in their pocket and trades, no one exits the room. But by, presumably, when you traded something, you got something you wanted more for something you wanted less. So the net wealth in the room rises, and that's an economy. So the economy beyond our basic survival is really just an exchange of desires, and humans don't run out of desires, we will not run out of jobs to provide those desires. It may shift to things like playing games and virtual reality, but the jobs will never run out. But, but in um, you know, human brains, uh, uh, um, I wanted to get into like, the nature of perception and how it's not what you think it is. Um, I think we have a slide that illustrates that. Can we see that last slide, please? I don't, well, yeah, and, and this is a slide. I, I like to say, look at it at top. Um, you know, what's beyond the sky or what's below this desk? And the answer is simple. It's the inner surface of your brain, right? We are, your eyes are two little holes that see sharply, and the rest is a blur. Uh, so if you look forward and you move your finger to the side, it's already a blur if you keep your eyes mm -hmm. forward. We only see a little bit sharp, but we think we live in this sharp Euclidean world where everything's straight. So this is showing that, uh, well, that, that, that slide, that, that the world within your head, uh, we, we are making this world, and we're getting some data, just like Stanley is getting some data, uh, the, to make up that world. And but it's not <coughs> a complete picture. It, like we're seeing part of the world, but it's not complete. Like you'd only see in one direction. Certain insects have these big bulbous eyes that right. have 360 degree vision. Their vision of the world is very different. So we see a little fraction maybe. So perception is made to give you a causal interface, a cause and effect interface to the world. Our perception fools us. Remember, we're only seeing like a little spot, um, clearly, and that's our fovea. The rest is blurred and blurred, but we, I experience myself in this room with the whole room. I even imagine what's behind me, and, and you know, I'm pretty happy living in there. When you look at Stanley's brain, it, remember it was that bird's eye view, and uh, you go, that's not the real world. The real world has flowers and dirt and, you know, bushes. Not for Stanley. It, it, the real world is a tilted plane with, with the white is good, red is bad, gray, I don't know. And, and That's for, real, real enough for him to do his job. Well, that was this causal interface to, to drive. It got that job done. Now, if you wanted to explain Shakespeare to Stanley, that simple brain, you might say, well, Shakespeare is a lot about tragedy. So you know what, Stanley, what Shakespeare is, is you know those GPS waypoints you want to follow. Well, what if there's a, you know, the road takes a right turn that goes a long way around, but some anxious robot sees a GPS point separated by a gray, unknown background, and it goes for that GPS point. Well, tragedy is sure to result, and that's kind of like Hamlet. Stanley will say, you know, oh, I understand Shakespeare now. And you'll say, no, you don't. You don't have the brain to do that. And your cat 
neither has the brain to understand Shakespeare. Even if you, you raise a cat on Shakespeare, it won't understand because it doesn't have the brain to do that. I, I like to say we are all Stanley. We do not have the brain to understand the reality of our universe. Um, and, and but we seem to understand enough of it to function in it, to do what we have to at, do in it. At our causal level. So we, we do very interesting things. Um, we're human. We, we, we have to get around, not bump our legs into things and be able to run away from tigers. But also we're a very social creature. We're interacting. We're very aware of social hierarchy. And you can see this in your dreams. You know, you see a full scene and, you're, and other people simulated. I, I like to say when you wake up, the dreams don't end. You, they, they're just connected to those little Stanley sensors. We call them eyes and maybe, mouth Maybe they're just drowned out by <laughs> the input of the conscious world. Uh, but, but, you know, so, so we see this world that's causally, cause and effect, uh, appropriate for us. And, and, you know, people way down at the quantum world, we're not experienced in that. And they go, oh, it's a wave, it's a particle. No, it's not. That's, a, that's our metaphor is breaking down. And, and, and you see it a lot. You know this table's made out of atoms that are mostly space. But we see it as a solid object because that's how we interact with it. But it's not the reality. So is one of our goals, or should it be, to enhance our perception, to make ourselves smarter by somehow getting a more comprehensive view of reality. For example, our eyesight works within a certain narrow band. Anything infrared, ultraviolet right. is invisible. If we had special glasses that could pick up those frequencies and push them into the visible range, we'd have sure. sort of a superpower. Uh, sure, and we already do. Uh, we, use, we use our machines to translate other sen sensations translate it into our little narrow senses of red, green, blue, and, and touch, and sound, and, and, and whatever. So we can see a galaxy far away because a giant eye has translated that image, uh, you know, and colorized it into something we can see and react. So we have expanded our space. And just like I could expand Stanley's space, I could try to show it a flower by creating images of uh, in its gray or white or red area. I could try to explain Shakespeare by explaining, you know, well, that's the robot that crosses the gray to hit the waypoint. It's the metaphor has become more and more stretched the further and further away uh, they become. So, you know, I, I, another analogy I use for this perception is a computer. Imagine you have your iPad or your Mac or something. There's a trash can item. I think I already said this. But I, you wouldn't be surprised if I tell you there's no real trash can in that computer, right? And uh, like I, I think I said, like a physicist might look at it and say, no, it's made at the reality. You're right. It's made out of a quanta. We call them pixels. But the real reality is there's a whole linear von Neumann architecture that's completely different from this interface. But the fact is, when you move something into the trash, it's deleted. That's the causal cause and effect. I want to get rid of that. I move it in the trash. It has that action. And so I like to say, when you see a car moving down the road, there's no car and there's no road. But if you stand in front of it, you will be deleted. The real reality is something very different. But for us to operate in the world, it's causally effective. There's cars, there's people. The nature of the reality might be very different, but we have an effective way at our scale and at our speed yep. of interacting with it. Now, when we try to make machines more intelligent, does that necessarily give us more insight into the way human intelligence works? Because the human brain is one of the least understood things. We understand a lot more about the world of nature than we understand about what's going on between our ears. For example, uh, Humans can have a lot of destructive impulses, and nobody knows why they're there. Nobody knows how to get rid of them. And yet some of these uh, impulses huh. can express themselves with nuclear weapons. So right. it seems like it would be pretty important to understand that uh, terrain so that we could sure. get it to do what we want. Well, I think just like I'm, I, I, I call it robot philosophy, make a brain to understand the brain rather than just um, trying to infer, and you'll see you run up to many constraints, energy, the need to represent. And so we do learn, I think, like these insights come, some from philosophers, and some from my having worked on brains and, and tried to extrapolate how are we the same. 
uh, you know, we're facing the same problems. So what we have as a human, we have evolved to interact socially, survive, mate, do all the things that humans need to do. And, and in that, there are, obviously, you, you wouldn't want to have to think about every breath you would forget one day and die. So there's a lot of automatic stuff that's happening. Just like in Stanley, there's a lot of systems in a car that are automatic. The wheels are turning, the gas is running, uh, you know, pumps are running in there, and, and Stanley isn't, like, thinking about all that. The planning doesn't involve that. The planning rides on top. Similarly for us, a lot of this stuff, we, we get scared of something, we hate something, we, and a lot of, like, impulses come we don't know because we're not, it's not part of our conscious planning. What, what's, uh, you know, I like, you know, a lot of this meditation and whatever, what is that? Like, we're, we're disturbed by parts of our brain we can't control. We want to, we feel stress, we want to get rid of it, but we can't say, go away, stress. Well, human self-emotions, uh, now there's such a thing as emotional intelligence, another type of intelligence, which might be defined as being able to predict how people are going to react to the things you say and do. Uh, can machines be given emotional intelligence and feel empathy, and it, is it just a simulation? Like if, sure. if you're having a conversation with a robot, should you try to be nice and polite so you well, don't hurt its feelings? Well, well sure, uh, emotional empathy could be. But uh, just to finish up that last thought, when, when, when we feel stress, we have to interact with it because it comes from the automatic system indirectly. So we meditate or we, you know, we indirectly let, the, let that pass. Or, <clears throat> but emotional intelligence, we, we do this with our animals. Like people impute that their dog is this, oh, it's mad at me. You know, not really. Your cat sees, you know, dog sees the world in very different ways. But we have like an interface to it because we're mapping our emotional response, which is somewhat the same as theirs. To a robot, yes, it can start mimicking it, especially, uh, you know, one of the big things with humanity is we're subject to death. And like a lot of our stuff is graded on that. Am I safe? Am I what? And, and so a robot, especially if the robot is subject to death, Stanley is, it's rolling over, it can relate like, oh, like the, the human is feeling like it, you know, he might take one of those um, paths that will cause him to roll over. I see, you know, that's fear and that I, I understand. You go, well, you don't really understand fear. You understand a physics simulation that caused you to roll over and that's a bad thing. But I, you don't really, so, uh, so in a sense, Stanley could relate to us, but not exactly. But obviously, we can design a robot that's much better at, if, if you needed to, to emotionally interact with humans. Well, can robots only do what they're programmed to do, or can you create a robot sufficiently complex that it can come up with new behaviors that you didn't tell it to do? Ah. Um, Sure. Uh, well, robots come up with new behaviors when they break. You know, anyone who's programmed one will go, ah. <laughs> but but uh, I, I think what we don't have yet is causal agents, you know, their own agents. I believe this is perfectly possible. Well, somewhat Stanley was. It, it, it had its goal in life. It was to travel and and, you know, it had its own agencies. And, and, and when something can actually do counterfactual causal reasoning about itself, then it can take different behaviors. The, so, so for us, uh, you know, I guess this gets a little into consciousness and self-awareness, but what I think is what we're a social creature. So in our simulation, in our Stanley map of our world, we simulate ourselves. Just as Stanley did simulate itself in, as a driver, we simulate our social self. I believe like what we're aware of, how we feel things rather than just experience. You have a blue shirt, I, ex I experience, I don't just have a blue bit that goes off, I experience it. And I think what we're doing is we're experiencing the simulation of my perception. And, and so, um, y y you know, we, we can, uh, <clears throat> from that, we experience a simulation of ourselves. We, become, we have a self-awareness. And I can then have this causal agency, this counterfactual, what if I did this? I can say, you know, what if I stood up and walked out? I can do that. I don't think I will right now, but, <laughs> but I could take these unexpected behaviors. 
according to what my emotional system is telling me, I have likes and dislikes. Remember, our programming is not the intelligence, it's our emotion. That's what guides you in what you do. That's what gives you your interest. Is there uh, an inherent difference between something that's alive and something that's a machine? Now, some people might say, well, a computer is a bunch of electric circuits, and a human brain is a bunch of electrical circuits, so what's the difference? And some people say, well, there's something about life which is intrinsically different that cannot be duplicated by a machine. You know, it, it's an argument, but I take the side that we can create life with uh, uh, robotics by making them a causal agent that can reason about cause and effect. They can experience their own simulation. They can have their own interior life. They can have their own goals. Do they become dangerous? Well, if you put that kind of emotional system in, inside them, they, they could. What well, if they start making demands? Uh, but We're you know, go on strike. Well, your computer already does make demands. Your phone makes lots of demands. It's always beeping and buzzing at you. It, in a sense, it is. But but sure, I mean, a causal agent that has sufficient emotion and whatever could take its own purposes. Uh, of course, that doesn't have to be programmed in. If it's interested in like exploring Mars, it it maybe it will kill you if you prevented it. But it's probably not interested in taking over our world or whatever. It, it really wants to take over Mars. Stanley really wants to go to the next goal point. It depends what emotions. If you build a military machine that's meant to kill, well, yes, it will kill. We just have about a minute left. Do you want to wrap it up by any comments about where this robotic AI revolution is ultimately leading us in 45 seconds or less? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, one of my heroes is Yehuda Pearl, uh, who, uh, you know, he's recently talked about this causal uh, part of intelligence being missed. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'd like to emphasize that, you know, we, we live in our, basically our own simulation, our own biological matrix that's meant to help us operate in the world. What's missing in a lot of artificial intelligence Right now, it's just pattern recognition, but it has to be put in a larger architecture, such as you must build to build a robot to, to get a full being out of it, uh, a real intelligence. Okay, and that's a good note to wrap on, and we're going to wrap right now. I'd like to thank my guest, Gary Bradsky, leading computer researcher, pioneer. I'm Marty Wasserman. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, we'll see you next time.